Chapter 4 USS San Clemente Upon receipt of orders, Bob Cantley, Lieutenant, Supply Corps, U.S. Naval Reserve, went through overseas transfer processing as required by the Navy. It included getting multiple vaccination shots, something called a port call, obtained from the personnel support activity, completion of transfer paperwork, arranging an overseas billeting for Shelley with her detailer, and pack out of the household goods, which included the family dog. The final requirement would be a checkout debrief from his current command at Treasure Island, California. Shelley would follow him soon with her follow-on orders to Guam once he got checked in. Her detailer had promised her that much. Bob had to get to Guam first to officially check in, then fly onward to where his ship was located in Subic Bay, located in the Philippine Islands. Now, several weeks later, Bob finally completed all the administrative outprocessing actions, including closing out their house and setting Shelley up in a temporary one-bedroom apartment in San Francisco until she could finish her sea school and then transfer to Guam. The pair said their goodbyes and kissed in the airport parking lot of Travis Air Force Base Air Operations Terminal. He grabbed her and held her in his arms, which surrounded her petite little body. Tears rolled down Shelley's cheeks, ruining her mascara. Some would have called this a pitiful sight. Bob thought her tears were beautiful. They'd been married for seven years now and beat the divorce odds that were so promising by Navy standards. Their love had grown stronger over their seven years together. Most military marriages failed for one reason or another in the first six years, but theirs had already surpassed that point. He loved Shelley more than the day he asked her to marry him in Newport and never had a second thought about it. Every time he thought about the night he asked her to marry him, he remembered how he asked her to stay with him forever on the steps of Newport's famed cliff walk. It was late at night, and the foggy mist from the ocean blew in, making it romantic, and helped lay the foundation for the rest of their lives. Like all couples, though, they had their ups and downs but their love had found a way to endure, at least for the time being. Oh, please don't cry, honey. You know I love you, I really do. Please don't cry. We'll see each other soon in Guam. And before you know it, you'll be getting your PCS orders. Just hang in there, Bob said as he wiped a tear off her cheek. Oh, but I'll miss you so much, she said with a whimper. We've only been apart for those periods when you were on the Philly. And now we don't even know when we'll really see each other again. I'm going to miss you so much. She continued sobbing. It'll be all right, Shelly. He kissed her and held her tight. So tight that he nearly felt it impossible for him to let go. Then he began to cry, and his eyes missed it over with the pain of separation. We'll be together again before you know it. Then, as if out of a daze, the airport terminal intercom of the airbase was heard to say, Mac flight 432, now boarding for Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. All personnel must have their boarding pass and military IDs ready for security and report to gate number one. With a quiver of his lips and trying to hold tears back, he said, Well, this is it. Goodbye, honey. He gave her one last kiss, turned and walked toward the security gate. With one last wave of his hand, he could see Shelley running away towards the entrance to the operations terminal doors in the direction of the parking lot. His heart ached as much as hers. He turned toward the security guard, got checked off against the flight manifest for the C-1A aircraft that would soon take him on the first leg of his trip to Guam, and then onward a day later to Subic Bay in the Philippines. Subic was his final port call, where the ship was supposed to be. He entered the passenger tunnel and walked out onto the tarmac. Once he finally got to Subic Bay, his new ship would head to the Indian Ocean for a short four months before heading back to its home port in Guam. Thank you, Lieutenant said the female Air Force Staff Sergeant. Have a nice flight to Guam. Well, I hope to, Sergeant. You have a nice day, too. Shelley went home to her newly empty apartment, waiting for the next day they'd see each other again. Bob had a lot of time to contemplate his new assignment while flying to his new ship. He knew it was going to be a workaholic ship. The San Clemente was known as a ship with two steel screws, turning and churning through the waters of the world, filling the cargo and supply needs of the fleet. She'd been involved in peaceful operational deployments 
to places he'd always dreamt of, like Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Thailand, Australia, and oddly enough, the Mediterranean. Recently, the ship had just spent the last six months deployed to the Persian Gulf in support of Operation Broken Eagle. The San Clemente was a combat cargo ship in every sense of the word. She could carry up to 6,000 pallets of cargo in her cargo holds and on deck. She had two large chill lockers for batteries, fruits, vegetables, and even beer. Each chill locker was the size of an ice hockey rink. One large freezer locker was for steaks, hamburger, lobster, and things needing freezing, including ice cream. She had two huge cargo holds for consumable supplies that included paper, rope, wiping rags, wire, and repair parts. The ship also had a section for medical supplies, drugs, and narcotics, which as it turned out, would be under Bob's direct control and not the medical officer. In Lieutenant Cantley's new assignment, he was the Material Control Officer, or Matt Conniff, for the 7th Fleet. It was an awesome job, where he was directly responsible for the resupply and care of 27,000 men and women on all ships of the 7th Fleet. It was now early on the morning of 15 December 1990, and with orders in hand, Lieutenant Cantley flew from Travis Air Force Base to Hickam Field, Hawaii, for a quick stopover and then onward to Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. His two flights on the C-1A cargo aircraft would consume a total of 18 hours in the air from the time he left California. After finally getting to Guam at 0400 hours in the morning, he was totally beat from jet lag. He grabbed his bags and went to the BOQ, or Bachelor Officer Quarters, to get some shut-eye. The next day, he awoke from his jet lag and headed right to the base housing office at Naval Air Station Aganya, Guam, to secure housing. He showed his PCS orders and secured a small two-bedroom house located in officer's country. This was something that had to be done since the couple already had personal household goods on its way to Guam, along with their family pet, Mr. Wiggles. And their dog would also have to go through six months of quarantine in Guam. Bob was ready to head onward to Subic Bay to catch his ship. The next day, he logged himself into the Military Air Command Terminal at Anderson Air Force Base and caught the next available aircraft going to the Philippines. He was able to get a C-141 Starlifter headed to Clark. Upon arrival, he got really lucky and was able to transfer directly onto the Navy CH-53 helicopter headed for NAS QB Point, next to the Subic Bay Naval Base. His new ship, the San Clemente, had just arrived into port of Subic Bay located just outside the port city of Olangapo. The ship was performing a resupply of cargo to sustain the 7th Fleet. It was an unbearably hot and humid tropical day. Sweat soaked his uniform through and through. After a short jeepney ride from the Air Ops Terminal to the BOQ at QB Point, he needed more sleep. He got 12 hours more to relax him from the long flight. Going through all those time zone changes, literally exhausted him. He hadn't been able to sleep on the aircraft, but he also didn't get much sleep in the BOQ since it wasn't air-conditioned and only had a ceiling fan, although it clacked loudly. Added to his woes, several cockroaches crawled on his face and down his legs while he tried to sleep. The bed sagged, making it very uncomfortable, and in his opinion of the Subic BOQ, it was no Marriott. The whole time he tried to sleep, he kept overhearing people talking in the hallway. Sounds came through his vents and under the wooden doorway, which also let the bugs crawl through. There was the never-ending banging of the headboards against the thin walls of the BOQ, as young naval officers staying there were busy fucking just about every horror they could bring back with them onto the base, to finish up what they began in Subic City or in Olangapo. Most of the bar girls they met up with out in town were the age of daughters they may have had back home. The whores had sex hard and fast with anyone they could, and the more the better to make money to support their families. The next morning, they'd been seen leaving the BOQ and scurrying back to their clubs. All Bob could do was put in his earplugs to drown out the sounds. Finally, he awoke feeling tired in the musty-smelling room. He was afraid of what lay ahead when he'd report to his new ship. 
Official letters he'd sent to the ship weeks before from stateside had gone unanswered. Both the ship's commanding officer and the senior supply boss had failed to reply to any of his letters. He didn't understand why. He never received any reply or welcome aboard packet from the ship, which was protocol. This was disturbing because according to Navy protocol, it's common courtesy to reply to any personal letter of a new person reporting to a ship, especially if it was an officer. Bob figured the non-response to his letters requesting information about the ship and what to expect was due to the time lag in the mails from the U.S. to the Philippines. He'd find out, though, that he was dead wrong. Well, fuck it. What the hell? Bob thought to himself. This is the morning I report and the day it all begins. Good or bad, it's time to get my ass out of bed and get going. He hoped for a good tour of duty and nothing the equivalent of another sloof. He got up, rolled himself out of bed, and got ready, throwing on his crisp, perfectly pressed dress white uniform, including his officer combination cover, a hat, white pants and shirt, white socks, and with white shoes. Navy officers were difficult to miss when wearing their dress whites. It made them look like the typical milkman of old, all decked out in white. At breakfast, he encountered what was to be his new supply boss, Commander David Wiggins. Commander Wiggins was to relieve the current supply boss on the ship, Commander Arnett. But Arnett was already gone, and Wiggins didn't know it. After breakfast, he checked out of the BOQ, pitched his baggage together, weighing nearly 180 pounds, walked outside into the bright sunlight, and had it loaded into the base taxi waiting outside. It was now 0800 hours in the morning as he headed to his ship, located at the Naval Supply Depot Piers, or NSD, located next to the Subic Naval Supply Terminal. The taxi wasn't able to take the lieutenant directly to the ship because of where it was located. The NSD piers were located in a restricted compound for reasons which didn't have much to do with terrorism as it did with local Filipino workers stealing goods. The old Filipino taxi driver said, Mister, I cannot get you any closer to the boat, mister. You can go to San Clemente yourself. You must get out of taxi here and go through gates over there where the marine guards are, okay? Well, how far do I have to walk with these heavy bags? Oh, not far. You see, mister. Lieutenant Bob Gantley grabbed his heavy bags, which filled the taxi's back seat, and put on his combination white cover. He began the long trek to the ship. Sweat dripped under the bill of his cap and down his face. His bags were so heavy that he had to let one of them drag on the ground as he walked towards the NSD gate, and there was no one to help. When he finally reached the Marine guards at the security gate next to the supply terminal, he asked them for a ride down to the pier to the ship, but was told by the guards he'd just have to hoof it since there were no vehicles and they were not allowed to leave their post. A little frustrated by all of this, Bob couldn't believe how bad the humidity was and how it was taking its toll on his once neatly pressed white uniform. Beads of sweat formed into rivers that flowed down his face from under the bill of his white combination cover and dripped down his nose and onto the front of his once clean white blouse. The hair under his cover was drenched and completely wet. All Bob could think of was getting a nice air-conditioned room aboard ship. It was not going to happen, though. As Bob approached the ship, a stern-looking naval officer in khakis, about six foot five, walked towards him. From a distance, Bob couldn't discern the officer's rank. He knew the officer was senior to him, and for that matter, nearly everyone was senior to him, except the enlisteds. As they neared each other, Bob could see his face wasn't friendly. The officer had a scowl on his face, and the brim of his hat was tilted forward on his nose just like a Gestapo officer. The figure looked menacing. Good morning, sir, said Bob Cantley, as he gave a neat, crisp military salute, which was returned in somewhat of a perfunctory manner. So you're the new guy we've been expecting, replied the commander, who wore gold oak leaves on his collar, that of a lieutenant commander. We've been expecting you. I'm Lieutenant Commander Richard Askew, the executive officer of the San Clemente. You'll get to know me well on your time aboard, Mr. Cantley. Right now, I'm on ship's business headed over to headquarters. We've got some business to attend to, but uh, we'll talk when I get back. By the way, 
After you get set up and your gear stored, report to me in my stateroom at 1900 hours. Understand? Aye, aye, XO, said Bob as he gasped for breath. He'd been totally caught off guard by this chance meeting with the new XO. Richard Eskew was a Naval Academy graduate and second in command of the ship. He was as mean as a barnyard dog. He had a sloped forehead that gave the impression he was missing part of his brain. The facial feature would later give rise to the nickname of Slopehead that was used aboard ship. He wasn't all that smart as an officer, just mean, abusive and sometimes to the extreme. This time he wasn't a sloof, but instead a tough, a tall, ugly fucker. Bob had discovered over the years that it was this exact person who would rise higher in rank in the Navy, and there wasn't much he could do about it. Bob had discovered over the years that it was this exact person who would rise to higher rank in the Navy, and there wasn't much he could do about it. Richard was practicing to be a CO, just like the one he tutored under, Captain Martin Manzak. But the XO was more concerned with people doing what he wanted done and cared little for others' feelings or rules. He also had a little time for his lovely wife, Shirley, who was 35 years old. Shirley stayed at home playing bridge or swapping stories with the other officers' wives in Aganya Guam. Shirley Askew was a requirement for Richard more than a wife. Most officers aspiring to become a CEO felt they needed to be married in order to reach that point in their careers. Image was important to senior officers. What was underneath didn't count. Shirley only counted for being there when Richard wanted sex, food on the table, or someone to show up at parties with him, so he could get promoted. For Richard, that had been all he thought she was good for from the very first time they met in college. He married her because it would be good for his career. Marriage would not be good for her. Richard knew he could keep her in bondage without skill or ability her entire life, so long as she followed him from one job to another. All she had was a liberal arts degree and no job experience, other than being a waitress. Richard never really loved her. He grew up being abusive and disliking women, just like his father. His father had abused his mother and he idolized his dad. So Richard Askew was no different. Bob would come to know his new XO in a way he would not be happy about. As he approached the ship, reality began to sink in as the sun beat down upon him on the hot concrete pier. After regaining his breath in the hot sticky air, Bob saw his ship just 250 yards ahead. God, what a sight she was, he thought to himself. She was a big gray hulk with FS-16 painted on her side. She was 565 feet long of solid gray steel and as wide as a cruise ship. But the San Clemente was no cruise ship. She was a working ship, often deployed for four to six months at a time, and rarely stopped at any ports for liberty. Her job was doing literally nothing but underway replenishments at sea, referred to as unreps. There was little time for liberty or having fun for the hardworking crew members. The ship was 20,500 tons of hauling capability, which could carry 6,000 pallets of provisions and general cargo, including the men and women who lived aboard the ship. Each man and woman of the mixed supply crew who served aboard the ship worked 18-hour days, seven days a week while on deployment. Having never been aboard a large, deep-draft ship like this, except when he received cargo during unreps from AFSs and AOEs while on the Philly, Bob didn't realize the enormous capacity or work environment of such an AFS as the San Clemente. She was a Mars-class ship of about 500 men and women and the size of a small town. She held a wide cross-section of society, with all its good, bad, and ugly rolled up into one living, breathing mass of humanity on a 500-foot-long gray steel platform. Some of the ship's crew were plain normal people, some, Bob would later find out, were criminal, homosexual, and even worse, but hidden by necessity. Others aboard the massive Grey Hulk were simply lost souls trying to survive day by day in the Navy and carve out a life. Nothing would prepare Bob for what he was about to experience aboard the ship. Much had changed in the Navy over Bob's last eight years. The men and women making up the Navy were now different. 
It was the difference between the old and the new Navy. Some sailors were more interested in what benefited them, while mission came second in importance. Honesty, integrity, and personal values had diminished as the use of technology grew. Yet this was not the norm for the majority of the crew. Moving cargo was their job, their only job. Years earlier, when his father had given Bob the speech about his time in the Navy, his dad had never really known the modern Navy that Bob would come to know now. The recruiter never told him the truth, just great stories with positive aspects about Navy life. Stories of tradition are what Navy recruiters used as a bill of sale for most graduating from high school, just like the Marine Corps recruiters. Briefings at OCS were filled with lots of pomp and circumstance, and there wasn't much truth about what to really expect in the fleet. Watching movies like The Silent Service and Victory at Sea didn't count for much in the modern Navy. All young officers, even those graduating from the Naval Academy, were led to believe that homosexuals, lesbians, and problem children were non-existent. They instead lived somewhere outside the Navy's circle of life and were not part of it. But in fact, it was all very much a part of the Navy. Bob learned a lot about people and the Navy over his last eight years, especially while he was stationed on the Philly. This new ship would be so much different than the carrier. How much? He was yet to learn. Cantley started to head up the ship's accommodation ladder carrying his heavy sea bag and dragging the other, but then had to back down to let a senior officer, Lieutenant Commander Jesse Eccube, off the ship. There was no room to maneuver. Eccube was the ship's operations officer. As Bob backed down to let him off, he was greeted by Eccube. Oh, you must be the poor son of a bitch they've been waiting for. I'm really feeling sorry for you there, buddy. But you've come to the wrong place and the worst for your career. Surprised at his greeting, he asked, Well, what in the world do you mean, sir? I've come to the wrong place? Lieutenant Commander Eckyrb replied, Well, until noon today, I was the San Clemente's ops officer. Your new skipper, Captain Martin Manzak, as you'll effectually come to know him as the Spine Ripper, just fired me. And he's kicking me off this ship. His ship. He just fired you? Yeah, he's shit-canning me right here in Subic Bay with no transfer orders, no money, and no means of support. Because he thinks I'm not his type of good officer anymore. He just told me to get the fuck off his ship and that I was fired. And since I'm no longer allowed to be on his ship, I had to get off here. You see, I'm a reserve officer, and the Spine Ripper hates reserve officers. You know, just like you. Further, he hates staff officers. Just like you. Worse for me... I'm a Chamorro, a Guamanian, and he doesn't like minorities either, whether you're black or whatever you are. Certainly I did some things the skipper didn't like, but we all do them in order to do our jobs. I've had my two strikes before making commander, but you, my boy, <laughs> your first strike lieutenant's being the supply corps officer, and your second strike, and what all the officers in the wardroom know about you, is that you're married to an enlisted gal. <laughs> Man, that's not cool with Manzac. If that's all true, you'll be shit kicked off this ship before you can count to three. You'll see later there, Lieutenant. Uh, you know, you'll have fun on your new ship. You're already dead before you've even boarded. Oh, and by the way, what's your name? Lieutenant Bob Cantley, sir. Well, Mr. Cantley, I don't envy you coming to this ship. I sure hope you didn't ask for this fucking ship. It's the pits. But you'll find out for yourself. You make your own decision. It's hard to tell a new guy like you such things. But it's the way it is, Bob. I got fucked. And now you're gonna get fucked. Just remember, Bohica is the word on the San Clemente. Good luck to you. Well, uh, uh, thanks for the information, sir. As Bob turned to watch Lieutenant Commander Eccube head down the pier, he was surprised to see two young-looking Lieutenant Supply Corps officers dressed in khakis standing atop the accommodation ladder next to the quarterdeck. Bob was still dripping of sweat. Perspiration dotted his forehead and now having regained composure, somewhat, he was greeted by the pair yelling and laughing to him. Go back, go quick, back, go quick, back, quick. One was an eight-year veteran naval officer from St. Louis, Missouri, well-educated and very knowledgeable about supply operations. He appeared about the same age as Bob, and his name was Lieutenant David Quirk. The other lieutenant, Randy Twig, also an eight-year veteran. The other was Lieutenant Randy Twig, also an eight-year veteran. 
He had a father who was a retired Navy captain in the chaplain's corps. His dad was a Baptist minister that entered the service right after the Korean conflict. Randy had been raised in a very strict household, and even though he joined the Navy to follow in his dad's footsteps. David had entered the Navy via ROTC, while Andy came from the Naval Academy. Randy was a bit naive and never had sex until after he joined the Navy, and only recently with the bimbos in Olangapo. He thought when he was having sex, he was in heaven, and no matter how ugly or smelly they may have been, he was in love. Bob would come to know both of the officers as good guys, who worked hard alongside their subordinates. They enjoyed being in the supply corps and they liked having a good time. Neither had any time for bullshit or make work, which was the CO's favorite pastime. They liked to do their jobs and move on to the next job, and they liked to party. They would come to like their new shipmate as he was just like them. Intelligent, fun-loving, prankster, and liked to play games just like them. In a loud voice, Lieutenant Quirk yelled out to Bob while leaning against the railing. You must be Bob Cantley, correct? We've been waiting for you, son, he said pointing at himself and his friend. I'm Lieutenant Dan Quirk, the stock control officer, and this here is Lieutenant Randy Twig, the food service officer. We'd really like to talk to you before you meet the skipper. Dave and Randy waited for Bob to get to the top of the quarterdeck and salute the ensign. Once there, Dave took Bob aside and said, Sure wish we could have written you about the ship, but we weren't permitted to by the skipper. We were under strict orders not even to talk to you. We did get your letters requesting information on the ship and the CO, but you'll come to understand soon enough that everything on this ship is under the strict control of the skipper. And we fondly refer to him as the Spine Ripper. And if you've ever heard of him, you'll know even more to steer clear of both him and the XO. Probably tired from your jet lag, right? Uh, yeah, sure am. Need some sleep? If so, now is a pretty good time to go and get it, because uh, you're not going to get very much when we get underway. Randy and I will give you a hand with your bags and get you set up in your stateroom. And then you can get a bite to eat in the wardroom before you catch a couple hours of rack time, okay? Uh, that's fine, thanks. Oh, and, and one last thing, said Dave. Just in case you bump into the skipper, no matter how close or far away you are from him, on the ship or on the pier, just salute him. Men's nuts about salutes. And it doesn't matter what the Navy rules say about paces or distance. Just salute him. Uh, okay, fine, I'll salute him. Bob grabbed a quick sandwich to eat from the ship's galley and dozed off to sleep in his two-man stateroom which was previously assigned to Lieutenant Commander Ekub. It was an eerie feeling to sleep in the same stateroom of the officer who was just fired by a maniac known as the Spine Ripper. Bob felt like he was in a holding cell just before execution, and he wondered to himself, What if Lieutenant Commander Ekub told me was true, or was it just his way of venting? Only time will tell. In the darkened stateroom, still sweltering from the humid tropical air and poor ventilation, Bob awoke a couple of hours later feeling drained. The tropical air entering his stateroom from the vents was hard to adjust to for anyone. He took a quick navy shower and grabbed a hot lunch from the wardroom. Then he headed down the ship's passageway to the main deck, where he'd meet with his new cargo division, Master Chief Storekeeper. Bob thought how odd the smell of the navy ship was, because he remembered the same smell when he was on the filly. It seems they all smelled the same. The paint, the hydraulic fluid, and aviation gases mixed in with a hint of the salt in the air. It was a peculiar odor which only existed aboard Navy vessels. Cargo Division's Master Chief Storekeeper, SKCM Brown, was nicknamed Mac by the crew. He was already up and loading cargo on Pier 5. Mac was a heavy set 290 pound black man who the captain hated with every ounce of his fiber. The skipper hated him partly because he was a racist, and partly because he didn't like anyone that worked for supply. Mac came up through the enlisted ranks from a seaman recruit, E-1, all the way to Master Chief, E-9, in 29 years of service. This ship would be Mac's last tour of duty, as he planned to retire upon reaching 30 years. Bob would find Mac to be friendly, knowledgeable, and firm in handling the men and women of S-2 Division. Both would come to respect each other as they performed their mission in the coming weeks. 
along with the manner of managing the cargo division's affairs. It wasn't easy leading 70 men and women of various racial, ethnic, and educational backgrounds. As was the case with roughly all Navy ships comprising of a variety of personnel from differing backgrounds, Bob's division was no different in its personal, work, and off-duty problems. Alcoholism, drugs, profanity, sexual addiction, and immorality were common among the working-class crew. They didn't come from the best of backgrounds or the best of homes. They were not middle-class people. They were workers that filled the slot, a need, and did a job the Navy required. As Lieutenant Cantley was taking a whiff of the fresh salt air and looking into the bright blue sky, the worst thing that could happen, happened. Just 50 paces from his position in the after-cargo bay stood Captain Martin Manzak. He was affectionately known as the God of the San Clemente. And for those even more unfortunate to intimately know him, the Spine Ripper. Lieutenant Cantley was about to find out why he had that handle. Martin Manzak was an East Coaster from upstate New York. From years of stress and giving it, the captain was a thin, lightweight man of 155 pounds, with thin, short, graying hair. His skin was light olive brown, dotted with liver spots all over his hands and face. He was deeply wrinkled from the time spent in the sun along with his years at sea. He told everyone that came in contact with him that his ass had been shot off by a SAM missile during the Vietnam War, and he didn't have any ass left to lose. But his unfriendly joking was for the purpose of making a point. He wasn't a nice guy, and didn't intend to be for anyone's sake. His wife Marge didn't think he was a nice guy either. She suffered years of emotional abuse from his awful form of a husband. His wife and daughters hated him and refused to live with him because of the way he treated their mother. They resided stateside in upstate New York. They were his family of convenience as marriage was an important image to his higher-ups. Marge was one of those officer wives for the purpose of having sex, bearing children, and doing as Martin asked without question. She was just like the XO's wife, but much older. She was without any professional skills, and she had served only as a homemaker for the last 20 years of their marriage. The money her husband made was enough to support her and his daughters in a comfortable lifestyle but not good enough to repair the bitterness between the captain and his family. He was an abusive alcoholic who had been known to beat his wife while his girls watched. Marge had decided to make the best of things and just stay in their home in New York, regardless of where he was stationed, and the Sam Clemente was no exception. Manzac had always put his career first. His family always came second. Captain Manzac was a decorated jet jockey by all Navy standards. He was a fighter pilot during the Vietnam conflict who had earned not one, but two Silver Star medals for bravery and bombing targets over Hanoi while being shot at by SAM missile sites. In both cases, he was able to fly his severely damaged A-4 jets back home to the carrier deck without crashing them over land or into the ocean. And for that, he earned his medals. The Navy considered him a hero, but not his family. She'd have been happy if he never came home. Manzac was as demanding on his family as he was on his squadron personnel. When his second daughter, Pam, was born on July 4th, he thought it would be cute to give her the middle name of aircraft carrier, because he loved aircraft carriers and was destined to become an aircraft skipper in the future. So Pam's legal name became Pamela Aircraft Carrier Manzac, and she hated her father for this and so did Marge. Ten months prior to Lieutenant Cantley reporting aboard, Captain Manzac had taken command of the USS San Clemente. As he'd done all throughout his career and at formal change of command ceremonies, he required his family to attend and then return home after fulfilling their legal and social obligation. Lieutenants Quirk and Twig were fortunate enough to attend the change of command and meet the skipper's family before Bob arrived. It was there that they learned the bitterness his family felt for their skipper, while talking chit-chat over some punch with their daughters. The captain demanded respect from all who served him. While waiting on the deck to talk to SKCM Brown, Bob was about to have his very first encounter with the Spine Ripper. As life would have it, 
Bob's time with the Spine Ripper was going to be worse than anything he'd ever encountered with Sloof on the filly. He just had a sixth sense. Slowly, Bob turned his head just slightly over his shoulder to the right. At that moment, Dave Quirk, the stock control officer, who was standing next to him said urgently, Bob, the captain's expecting you to salute him. Now! Do it! He's crazy about salute. Remember what I told you when you came aboard? Amazed and confused with Dave's big fuss over the captain's need for a salute, but remembering what Dave had told him earlier, said, What the fuck you talking about, Dave? That's crazy. Nobody salutes a captain from 60 paces away. It's just stupid. In a very hushed voice, Quirk said, What the fuck is... That cocksucker's crazy. He wants people to bow down to him, and he intends to let you know who's boss around here. It's important that you render homage in the way he likes it. It eases his sense of personal inadequacy. So don't screw with him, Cantley. Just fucking salute him now. Dave Quirk was in a fit of anxiety knowing the fate of other officers being booted off the ship were not doing exactly as the captain expected. Hey, I don't want to piss him off, said Bob. I just happen to know that according to naval regulations, that to salute you're supposed to be within five paces, not sixty. I don't give a shit about regulations, just salute the motherfucker and do it now!" Quirk demanded. Okay, fine, I'll salute him. Within a split second, as if Lieutenant Cantley stood frozen in time, he began to raise his right hand to render a full and proper salute to the captain. It was like the scene right out of the TV show Gunsmoke from the 1960s, with James Arness playing Matt Dillon. Manzac got ready to draw from the hip, just like James Arness. As Bob's hand slowly rose to touch the hat on his head, called a piss cutter, the skipper's eyebrows raised, showing displeasure towards Bob. As each second passed with Cantley slowly raising his hand, higher in order to finish his salute, and as his hand got closer and closer to the brim of his hat, the captain showed a crazed look in his eyes. Finally, as the salute rendered by Bob was completed, a full salute, slightly touching the edge of his piss cutter, Captain Manzac failed to render his return salute in the normal way. Instead of immediately dropping his hand quickly to his side, he instead held it there for what seemed like an eternity at full salute. Junior officers are not allowed to drop their salute until the senior officer drops theirs first. Finally, Manzac returned Cantley's salute with what looked like a full-blown karate chop. Until the captain dropped his salute, Bob had to hold his salute. Manzac's right hand cut through the air like a razor blade, downward and fast enough to cut a man's head off. It was anything but normal. But Bob knew at that moment he'd walked into a situation he'd regret. He was going to have many run-ins with his new boss, the Spine Ripper. After the unnerving experience with the skipper, Bob made a beeline for SKCM Brown standing nearby. Master Chief Brown was greatly overweight for Navy standards, but he didn't really care about his weight but what people thought, because he was about to retire. The commanding officer, the XO, and most of the other line officers on the San Clemente looked down on the Master Chief, who happened to be the Command Master Chief. Because Mac didn't represent what certain officers on the ship thought a Command Master Chief should look like. They thought he should be the spitting image of perfection rugged fitness and, of course, a white male. The skipper disliked him, but his appearance wasn't going to be a problem for Bob. He came to realize quickly they had a bond that would weather storms ahead. Bob would find out soon enough that the Spine Ripper had a disdain for gays, blacks, women, supply corps officers, and most of all, officers married to enlisted. If a sailor didn't fit into the captain's mold of what the Navy man or woman should be, let alone his Navy, then they were of no use to him. Every chance the skipper got, while talking to the XO and other senior officers in the wardroom, he made it known that he really hated pork chops and reserve officers. It was pretty clear that Bob had his three strikes out even before he stepped foot on his new ship. On the San Clemente, the saying Bohica was the norm. It meant, bend over, here it comes again. In essence, you are going to be fucked in the ass every day, every week, every month, no matter what you did on the ship. And it would never be good enough for the Spine Ripper. So for being overweight, Mac didn't have a chance in hell of not being tormented. 
His new division officer, Bob Cantley, and he would become close during their short time together. They'd help repair each other's souls and protect the reputation of the cargo division in the days ahead, while deployed to the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. When Lieutenant Cantley walked over to meet his master chief after his encounter with Manzac, he found Mac leaning on the port railing with his head hung down. He was viewing cargo pallets being loaded onto the ship's starboard aft cargo decks by the local Filipino stevedores and his S2 division. Bob couldn't really tell if the Master Chief was sad, disgusted, or just doing his job. Mac was responsible for ensuring overall safety of every bit of cargo, as was Bob. Master Chief, Bob said, we need to have a talk in private in the cargo office now. There's stuff going on, and uh, I need you to understand real quickly about Manzac, so I don't step on my crank, if you know what I mean. Yes, sir, I do. Sounds like a real good idea to me, since things are going okay here. Let's go have that chat. In the aft cargo office on the starboard quarter of the ship, aft of the cargo bay, the Master Chief informed his new boss of the dangers on the ship. They weren't shipboard dangers. It was instead about backstabbers, pranksters, false rumors, and intentional problems created and orchestrated by the captain and his cronies. Manzac liked to push the supply department around and screw with anyone he didn't like. Individuals like the skipper, he said, were deranged from years of bullying others, and coupled with unlimited authority, he'd provided a perfect breeding ground for narcissists like the skipper. He believed he was immune for any punishment under the UCMJ for anything he did. In other words, he was much like Admiral Rickover. Navy regulations were for everyone else, except for Manzac. Well, sir, there are a few officers aboard the ship who have a propensity for being real hard on enlisted, minorities, and women. Oh, shit, just people in general. They consist of certain officers like Deck Department Head Lieutenant Jones, the Chief Engineer, Lieutenant Commander V, the XO, and of course, you know, the Spine Ripper. Certainly there are others, but those are the worst you'll have to deal with. Each has little regard for the lives and welfare of the crew, even their own men and women. Oh, and there's also the ship's do-nothing chaplain. His name is Lieutenant John Trainer. You ain't met him yet, have you? Uh, no, Master Chief, I haven't. You mean the ship's chaplain is worthless? What's he like? Well, he's a big old burly kind of guy, about 250 pounds, a pure Georgia boy. He comes from a place you might know called Athens, Georgia. He's got short red hair and, believe it or not, a beard. I don't see any officers wearing beards these days. The skipper doesn't really like him wearing it, but for some strange reason, lets him keep it, as long as it's neatly trimmed. Wow, I haven't hardly seen any officers with beards since Navy regs changed a couple of years ago. So if he doesn't really do anything, I guess the only reason he's aboard is the ship's allowance list calls for us having a chaplain, huh? Yep, pretty much. And he likes to talk a lot about getting into conversations, so uh, stay away from him. He's a meddler. He'll just waste your time. If you know what I mean, sir. I do, Master Chief, I do. But tell me, what's all this stuff about Lieutenant Commander Ecu? You know the guy thrown off the ship by the skipper? I found out that the skipper had just booted him off the ship just before I came aboard. You know, I met him on the accommodation ladder. And from what I've been told, it sounds really crazy. What really happened before I got transferred here? And why did my letters really get answered by the skipper or the supply boss? Well, sir, let me ask you something first. But do you promise to keep everything I tell you in this office strictly between you and me? Oh, yeah, Master Chief, I do. Well, first the skipper did get your letters. Lieutenant Quirk brought them down to me as soon as they hit the ship's mail room. Quirk is a good officer, sir. I should have known about you coming since I was going to be your leading chief in the S2 division. And I too should have written to you not to come here. But we're all under strict orders not to speak to you or even write. Manzac caught Lieutenant Quirk in the passageway outside the mailroom, holding your letters, as he was coming to see me with them, and he asked me who they were from. It was just after official mail call. Quirk didn't want to tell him, but the captain grabbed them right out of his hands, decided to keep the letters until after he read them, even though they were specifically addressed to the supply boss, Commander Arnett. You'll learn soon enough, sir, how stuff goes on in this ship. The skipper had already received the naval message through ops about your PCS orders. 
probably about the same time you received yours. Evidently, he found out that you were married to this enlisted gal, and he's old school. He really hates that shit. Anyway, just about the time everyone found out that you were coming to the San Clemente, the senior supply officer, or Supo, got in some really big trouble with the skipper and the Commodore at Carrier Task Force 73. Turns out Manzac found out that Commander Arnett was going to the Commodore at CTF-73 and informing them about some illegal stock transfers executed off the books, which were valued at some $250,000. These transfers had been done by the guy you're now replacing, Lieutenant Mann. He got sent to Naval Postgraduate School out of the blue. He did whatever he was directed to by Manzac, without the Supo's knowledge or approval. He made illegal and unfunded transfers for lobsters, steak, beer, wine, typewriters, and even car tires. They were basically stolen from right out of the cargo holds and transferred out of our ship's stocks to the mayor of Olangapo on the skipper's behalf. It was most likely to cover his gambling debts ashore, plus the cost of high-class whores that the mayor had sent to him each time he came to Subic. All this cost big time along with some favors he provided to the Guamanian governor back in our home port in Naganya, Guam. Manzac was well known for taking the stuff ashore, putting it in his official government vehicle and giving it away. He even gave away freebies like IBM Selectric 3 typewriters that had been just delivered to the ship. The ID tags hadn't even been put on them yet. You see, sir, he liked to eat and drink with the local politicos, even up in his own private mess while we were in port. He's got lots of women, liquor, and visitors come aboard to wine and dine. The captain was so busy scoring points with influential politicians, especially in our own home port. His favorite politician on Guam was the island governor, Romaldo Boldomero. And the skipper also pulls the same shit when we pull into Subic with the mayor of Alangapo. Anyway, the captain was livid that one of his department heads, Commander Arnett, was trying to do him in about his unethical and criminal behavior by reporting him to CTF-73. So he did what any good skipper would do. He covered his ass by turning the tables on Commander Arnett by making up stories about his old supply boss. Somehow Manzac turned the whole situation, theft and all, around to his benefit before Commander Arnett could get the real truth about what was going on to those in charge at CTF-73. Manzac had made it look like Arnett had orchestrated the whole inventory transfer of stolen goods to gain political points. He also got Lieutenant Mann to fake papers showing that Commander Arnett even paid for whores with the ship's Optar funds. It was all bullshit, of course, if you know what I mean. Quirk and I both figured it out, along with a couple of the supply CPOs working in stock control. We found out that Mann forged Commander Arnett's signature on a number of inventory forms for the missing inventory from the cargo holds. Somehow we got Commander Arnett to sign several blank ship survey documents called DD Forms 154s, with nothing typed on them. Maybe Arnett signed the form without looking at what Lieutenant Mann had put in front of him, because he was too trusting. I just can't believe that. Arnett trusted everyone way too much. He was a good guy, just naive. I personally thought Arnett was a real slackjack for an officer, you know what I mean, sir. What none of us realized at the time was that Mann was a through-and-through -through confidant to the Spine River. A lousy fucking little spy right here among the rest of the supply department. No disrespect intended, sir, but Lieutenant Mann was the biggest fucking backstabbing son of a bitch supply officer I ever met in my 29 years in the Navy. Oh, he'd talk all nice to you out of one side of his mouth and then run up to the skipper stateroom every chance he got to tattletale on the supply department. He knew how the CO hated supply and loved to rub dirt in our faces, and he did so for his benefit alone. That little bastard wanted to make points for the skipper for the purpose of getting a good fitness report and orders off this bucket. He did a real good job of it, got promoted and then got transferred off this rust bucket before all the shit went down with the inspector general from CTF-73. The CTF Office of the Inspector General Investigation turned the tables on Arnett and claimed that he was a guilty party. Arnett was sent to Admiral's Mast here in Subic in discipline. He received a letter of reprimand 
and has since been transferred back stateside for retirement and to go to his home of record. Beware, though, that one of his little buddies is still aboard, which happens to be the dispersing and sales officer. His name is Ensign Ken Waters. Well, thanks for all this depressing info, Mac. Sounds like that's the kind of officer Manzac likes, Master Chief. I haven't met Ensign Waters yet, but will soon when I turn in my personal financial record into the dispersing office for my first payday. Sir, officers like Lieutenant Mann make me want to puke. You better be careful what you say around the skipper, the XO, and Ensign Waters, and the other officers on this ship. The new ops officer, Lieutenant Vogel, who took Mr. Ecube's place, is just as corrupt as man. He'll stab you in the back and pull rank on you, make you look bad and do whatever he can to fuck with you and supply. You name it. But anyway, back to more of what you wanted to know. The captain got what he wanted. During the IG investigation that convened, he made the Commodore believe his version of the story about the inventory shortage and not Arnett's. The Commodore took Commander Arnett to Admiral's Mast and gave him a formal letter of reprimand. So Arnett's now gone. You'll be happy to know that we got a new supply boss meeting the ship when we get to Diego Garcia, or maybe even before. His name's Commander Wiggins. Oh yeah, Master Chief, I already met him in Subic. Well, he'll be there when we arrive in Diego Garcia. Since Arnett got transferred off the ship this week, we'll be without a senior supply officer until he comes. The current assistant supo, Tony Shapiro, is now acting, or acting like an asshole is more like it. I want you to know that I don't respect the CO, XO, or most of the officers on this ship, sir. But you can probably already tell that, Mr. Cantley. I want you to know that I'm not a bad Master Chief, regardless of what you hear from others. The men and women in this division will work their asses off for you if you treat them decent, unlike what man did. You can trust Quirk and Twig, too. But I'm not so sure about the chaplain. He's just weird. It's sad to say that about a chaplain. You can trust me too, sir. Just give me a chance, because I'll give you a chance, sir. You seem like a good guy. I don't want to tell you too much to disillusion you about this cargo ship. Just don't forget, the Skipper and XO will abuse you every chance they get, if you let them. They treat the crew like whale shit, so don't expect anything different from them. Oh, how I already know that. I met the XO when I was coming aboard, and he seemed like a really nasty SOB and I've got to go meet with him soon." Mac continued. Well, the Captain and XO are the most self-centered assholes you may ever meet in the entire Navy. Oh, and one last thing, sir. You should know that they hate everybody who's not a line officer. For starters, you are already on their shit list since the day they were notified of your coming. Nearly every supply officer, in fact, is on their shit list. Except for the likes of Man and Ensign Waters. All supply officers who've been under this CO, except for Ensign Waters, have been screwed by Manzac, except EQ. And he was a line officer, reserve officer, and a minority. Master Chief, you just do your job and keep my butt out of a sling, okay? No problem, sir. I'll do my best. I guess we better go do some work now. We got some cargo to finish loading. That yeah, sounds good to me. I gotta go see the XO, as he requested when I saw him on the pier. Then I'm going to go get some rack time before our big storage loadout for tomorrow, Master Chief. Jet lag is still bothering me. Can you handle everything without me today? No sweat, sir. Been doing it for a long time. They both had a huge cargo loadout scheduled to attend the next day. The ship would be taking on over 1,400 pallets, 4 million pounds of fresh and frozen provisions, and later many pallets of consumables, which they would provide to other ships of the carrier task force during underway replenishments. At 0600 hours, Bob was awakened by a call from Master Chief Brown, even before the day had begun. Sir, I'm sorry to wake you an hour early before sunrise, but you need to get down here to the main deck quick. You got a real problem going on. I'll tell you about it when you get down here. Okay, Master Chief, see you in a couple of minutes. Was his reply, half awake from the disturbing call. On the main deck, aft amidships, in the area of the after cargo bay, stood the ship's deck department officer, Lieutenant Jones. He was having a fit about one of the ship's pallet conveyors being broken. It seems there was a breakdown in the switching relay mechanism when the upper deck phone talker and the lower deck phone talker had a miscommunication. 
The storekeepers in S2 Division had been up early in the morning taking on stores, long before their division officer got up. The Master Chief was running the operation, and normally officers just oversee loadouts, not getting directly involved in the actual work unless it's needed. CPOs and senior enlisted personnel managed the day-to-day -day operations. In this particular case, the shit hit the fan for everyone, because one of the deck department's leading POs accused S2 cargo personnel of causing the breakdown. Lieutenant Cantley was about to get his first dose of what being aboard the San Clemente meant for supply officers. On the main deck approaching the after cargo bay, Bob came upon the broke dick situation. Hi, right, Master Chief, what's going on here? He asked inquisitively as he approached the group of storekeepers and deck maintenance personnel surrounding the pallet conveyor elevator. Cantley stuck his hand out to introduce himself to the deck officer he hadn't yet met, saying, Sir, I'm the new cargo officer, and I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet. So, uh, what seems to be the problem here? So you're the new pork chop I've heard about. Well, it seems that every time the San Clemente gets one of you fucking pork chops aboard, something goes wrong. All you fucking supply guys do is screw things up, said the hostile deck officer. Your storekeepers fucked up my equipment, and now you're going to pay for it, chop. Whoa, ho, ho, now hold on there, Mr. Jones, said Mac Brown, visibly agitated. You pull this shit on the supply department every time something goes wrong, and it's usually your guys that are fucking things up. I don't know what makes you think supply personnel broke your precious little conveyor. Things sometimes happen. Humans make mistake, and, you know, mechanical problems do occur. You don't go around accusing my people of making up falsehoods unless you got proof to back it up. Fact is, your pallet conveyor just stopped working. It got stuck. Bob Cantley jumped into the heated conversation, trying his best to calm the ever-increasing battle without success, saying, Look, you're both a little irrational about this, it seems. I haven't been aboard long, but you don't go around accusing people, Lieutenant Jones especially without any proof that they've done something wrong. So just who says that my people broke your precious little pallet conveyor anyway? And turning to Mac, Bob said, Now, Master Chief, let's try to act a little more civil to a senior officer, okay? At that, Mac shook his head and said, Certainly, sir, whatever you want. It was not so much an agreement, but a disgusted response. Then Bob continued, You know, I'm sure we can get to the bottom of the situation without getting all hostile. Isn't the most important thing to get on with fixing the pallet conveyor to meet our ship's mission and deploy on schedule? I may not all be that knowledgeable about this kind of stuff, but I do know common sense dictates a little bit of reserve in such situations. Mr. Jones, although you may have been aboard a little longer than me and seem to infer that you're superior, I happen to run S2 Division, and I'll tell you this. You don't accuse my people or go around causing problems without going through the chain of command first. You of all people should know that. So why not start acting like a grown-up? Bob statement really set the deck officer on fire. Bob continued saying, You know, the chain of command usually means you come to me first, and not jump down my Master Chief's throat or up and down like a little child over something that's fixable. Heatedly, Jones replied back, So, Lieutenant Cantley it is. You don't know who you think you're talking to, mister. You better watch your mouth. When I tell Captain Manzak about how your people destroyed my pallet conveyor, you're going to be in a world of shit. Then you'll have to deal with the consequences, buddy boy. Oh yeah, we'll see about that, Mr. Jones. Cantley replied. I'm not afraid of you, or the CO, or anybody else for that matter. I know when right is right and wrong is wrong, and you're beginning to really piss me off with your stupid shitty little attitude. Mr. Jones to you, you asshole. I've always hated you fucking pork chops, and you just confirmed it once again. I'm gonna go tell the captain, and your division will find itself on report. See how you like that. Well, you gotta do what you gotta do, Mr. Jones, but you won't get any cooperation from me or my storekeepers with your childish attitude, you stupid fucking asshole. What did you just call me, Lieutenant? I called you a stupid fucking asshole, you dickwad. Want me to repeat it once more in case you didn't hear it the first time? Up yours, chop, said Jones, as he stormed off the main deck to see the spine ripper. As the minutes passed, the rest of the crew had already heard about the argument between the two officers as did most of the enlisted and officers in the supply department. Within the hour, everyone on board would know. Over the ship's 1MC loudspeaker came the following notice. Now hear this. That's how it's All supply department personnel assembled in the after cargo bay area. And that includes Lieutenant Cantley. Cantley just shook his head, 
as did his master chief in disbelief. They both knew what was coming. Several of the storekeepers standing near the new officer looked at each other and also knew what was coming. SK-1, storekeeper first class, White said, Sir, you're about to get a taste of what Bohica and being on the San Clemente means. We've all been through this shit before. I just hope you're going to still be our division officer an hour from now, sir. White just chuckled to himself. Just after SK-1 White spoke, one of the ship's master-at-arms, MA-2 Jones, approached Cantley and said, Sorry, sir. I have orders to tell you and the other members of the supply department to get in formation for the XO. So please have you and your people form up smartly. What do you mean, form up? You're an MA-2. You're not an officer. Just doing what I was directed by the XO to do, sir. XO told me to come on down here and put you and all your people into formation and be ready for his inspection and to be addressed by him. Well, let me tell you something, MA-2 Jones. You don't tell any officer to ever fall into formation. Nor do you ever tell an officer what to do. MA-2 Jones showed a little fear and said, Sir, I'm just, I'm, I'm just doing my job, sir. The CXO ordered me to do this. That may be so. You can form up the enlisted personnel if you wish, but don't you ever tell me what to do. Understand? I'll deal with the XO myself when he gets down here. As minutes passed, men and women storekeepers from all divisions within the supply department came trickling out of the ship's holds and workspaces. About 80 men and women total. Lieutenants Quirk, Twig, and Ensign Waters all arrived on the main deck, as did the assistant supply officer, Lieutenant Commander Shapiro, who Bob Candley hadn't met yet. Lieutenant Commander Shapiro asked in front of all the supply department personnel, What in the hell's going on here? Quirk replied, I thought you knew everything going on on this ship, Tony. You're always telling us how you know everything, so why don't you tell us right now? That was real smart, David. I don't have the slightest idea any more than you do. But I sure as hell don't like this kind of crap going on. It's bad for morale. Yeah, sure, Tony. Like, you care about this just like you care about everyone else's problem on the ship, don't you? What do y'all mean by that wisecrack? I mean, you're a spineless little SOB and always will be. You didn't do anything to stand up to the old supo, did you, Tony? You just left Arnett out there to dry with the CO. You knew Lieutenant Mann was involved in all that fraud stuff and theft of property, and yet you didn't do a damn thing about it, did you? That's what I mean. Knock it off, Quirk. I mean it. I won't have you talk to me like that in front of the troops. If you continue, I'll bring you up on charges for insubordination. Really? It doesn't matter, Tony? The troops all know you're a weasel. Just at that moment, a verbal fight was about to break out between Shapiro and Dave Quirk, the XO approached with the senior ship's master-at-arms, MA-1 Peterson. The XO, Lieutenant Commander Richard Askew, yelled at MA-2 Jones for not having all the supply department personnel already in formation. God damn it, Jones. I told you to have these people in formation by the time I got down here. What the fuck have you been doing for the last 15 minutes? Walking around with your dick in your hands? Now get these sailors in formation now. And that means you officers, too. Askew pointed with his index finger at the supply officers to remind them that he was in charge. The XO informed the MA-1 he would be waiting for them to form up at UMREP Station 3, and he'd be with Shapiro, the assistant chop, having words. From a distance of about 50 paces, the formation of officers and enlisted could see the XO yelling at Shapiro on the starboard side of the ship. The XO was poking his finger vigorously into Shapiro's chest and just kept right on poking him. Shapiro stood there and took it, doing nothing to defend himself. It looked like a domestic dispute between a husband and wife. The men and women of the supply department were all giving each other funny looks because of the humility their assistant supa was being put through. They couldn't understand why he didn't fight back. In the Navy, it's a common thing for a loss of respect to occur for one superiors when they don't defend themselves. If Shapiro wouldn't stand up for himself, and he damn well sure wasn't going to stand up for the crew in the face of adversity. The supply department just stood there motionless in the after-cargo bay and watched as the two men waved their fists back and forth and yelled at each other. Finally, the assistant supo walked over to where his troops were in formation and fell into ranks along with the rest of the supply department. The XO then walked over to the formation of supply department personnel and began yelling, I want to know who's responsible for the destruction of Conveyor 2 in the forward cargo bay. 
The skipper's tired, and I'm tired of you supply people not paying more attention to your duties. Being careless and destroying government property. You think you can get away with it? Well, you won't. Not on my ship. So I'm going to make an example out of all of you, including you supply officers. For the next week, while we're here in Subic loading out stores, nobody in the supply department goes ashore except for official business. There'll be no liberty, and that's final. I hope you're all happy with yourselves. As the XO stormed away towards his stateroom, which also served as his office, he was heard to say, MA-1 Peterson, have the assistant chop dismiss the people. Aye, aye, sir, yelled MA-1 Peterson in reply. Commander Shapiro, the XO said you may now dismiss your people. I know what he said, you jackass. Now get away from me. At that, Shapiro dismissed the supply department, saying, Dave, Randy, Bob, I want to talk to y'all guys before you head back to your workspaces. Well, tell me why, Tony. You got some good news for us from the XO? Asked Dave. Uh, let's not get into this again, Dave. Just drop it. What I want to say is, as you saw the skippers on the warpath, excuse just carrying out his dictates. What the XO told me, in no uncertain terms, was that the captain was thinking about preferring formal charges against all of you, including your master chief, Bob. Says he thinks you're all responsible for the destruction of the pallet conveyor due to maintenance problems, which are constantly brought to his attention by the deck officer, Lieutenant Jones. Oh, that's total bullshit, and you know it, Tony, said Bob. None of us here are there, and we're not responsible for the maintenance. Deck department is. Bob was about ready to hit the assistant supo, but Randy Twig jumped in saying, Time and time again, that fucking little bastard is out to do us in, and make our department look bad. If he thinks I'm going to get us court-martialed for something we didn't do and had nothing to do with, he's got another thing coming. Ship's master dog, Dave then jumped in and said, And what about you, Tony? Are you going to be right in there with the rest of us getting court-martialed? Or are you the one that's going to do their dirty work? The assistant supo just stared up in the air in disgust. Well, said Lieutenant Cantley, I'm new to all of this, but I got to agree. I'm not taking the fall for the kind of horse crap that Jones is telling the CO about. Look, I agree with you guys, Lieutenant Commander Shapiro said. The captain's probably just blowing smoke like he does all the time. He'll be back down. Just wait and see. Well, that's easy for you to say, Tony. You haven't been fired from your job. Given a bad fitness report or lost your career. And you aren't one of the ones who charges are going to be preferred against. You always walk that fine line. May I know, but... But what? You don't know shit. That's what. I'm going over to see a lawyer at Subic Legal. Why don't you all come with me to the Navy Legal Service Office? David inquired. Lieutenant Twig, Candley, and Master Chief Brown all agreed that it was the proper thing to do, considering the irrational behavior exhibited by the captain and the XO. Ensign Waters interjected. You know, I don't think it's a good idea to get involved. I'm in good stead with Captain Manzac, and this doesn't have anything to do with me. Yeah, that's right, you little weasel. You stay here and play your cards with the skipper like you always do, said Dave. Guys, let's meet at the quarter deck in about an hour to go over to base legal, okay? Said David. They met at the quarter deck shortly after noon chow in the wardroom. It was just about 1,300 hours and David had placed a call to the Navy legal office to ensure a Navy lawyer would be available to talk to them. And there was. Her name was Lieutenant Commander Deborah Hunter, a seasoned trial attorney for the base. She had little civilian experience but loads of experience in military trial law. They commandeered a government vehicle from the duty transportation officer and drove to base legal. The XO later found out the group had left the ship without his permission. All the officers were required to personally check with the XO before departing. This was his rule, and it would be another breach they would all regret. Once they arrived at the NLSO, they were pointed towards the direction of Lieutenant Commander Hunter's office. Her office looked very official, Navy yet feminine. She had flowers located in several vases on the opposite sides of her office. Sit down, gentlemen, she said with a smile. I suppose you're the fellows from the San Clemente that called my office earlier, stating that you just had to talk to a lawyer, right? Yes, ma'am. I'm Lieutenant Quirk, and this here is Lieutenant Candley, Lieutenant Twig, along with Master Chief Brown. Well, I don't have a lot of time, gents. Tell me what you've got, and I'll see what kind of advice I can give you. Well, Commander, our skipper is planning, or so he says, to court-martial each and every one of us for destruction of government property, a pallet conveyor, 
which broke down due to mechanical failure this morning when the ship was bringing on stores. Did you or any of you have anything to do with the conveyor breakdown? Asked Commander Hunter. No, ma'am, stated Cantley. It's simply a case of the CO gone nuts, an outright case of abuse. He knows it's just a simple mechanical failure, but he wants to blame all of us because he hates the supply officers. I've never seen such bullshit in my entire life. It feels like a horrible dream. I was a civilian before coming to the Navy, and personally, I can't believe I'm seeing things happening like this. It's a zoo on this ship, and I've only been on the ship for a couple of days now, said Bob. Man, I've been on this ship for over a year now, and you wouldn't believe some of the things that are happening, said Quirk. Oh, yes, I would, Lieutenant. I've come to know a lot about your ship. But why don't you tell me what you personally know about Banzac? Asked Hunter. Well, the ops officer had just been fired from the ship, dumped here in Subic without any orders or money. Yes, I already know about that one, and we're working on the situation right now. The current leading chief petty officer, Stewart, of engineering, was relieved of his duties and has filed an Article 138 pending against the skipper. Lieutenant Jim Jason, a former CIC officer, was kicked out of the Navy, relieved of his duties for something he didn't do. And they also have to concur with Mr. Cantley. The captain's gone nuts by saying he's going to have us all court-martialed for some stupid, insane idea that we destroyed his goddamn equipment. Okay, I got that. What do you have to say, Master Chief? Commander Hunter asked. With a big sigh and his head hung low, Master Chief Brown took his plastic black-rimmed glasses off and began to slowly speak his mind. Ma'am, I'll try to put this in more civil tone than these guys. I've been on the San Clemente for several years now. Four years, in fact. I've been in the Navy for 29 years and never seen anything quite like it. I've never been treated so poorly, so disrespected from a commanding officer. I've never seen so much unmilitary behavior by officers. No disrespect, ma'am, but I can't believe I'm here, sitting in your legal office. Lieutenant Twig sat motionless and then said, Commander, the captain is a maniac. He's unethical and he's lacking in moral fiber. Please, can you help us? You know about what happened to Commander Arnett, don't you? Well, gentlemen, first, you'll be surprised to know that I know a great deal more about your ship and Captain than I said at first. I happen to be handling Chief Stewart's Article 138 charges, the CPO's complaint against Captain Manzak. We're conducting an investigation as directed by CTF-73. I do understand your concerns, though, just as I do Chief Stewart's. But I will tell you this. Your captain is not a widely respected man on this base, especially by Admiral Tooley. You know Tooley, head of ComNav Philippines. He's rather nonplussed with your skipper, to say the least for all of his stupid, lazy, lame stunts he's pulled on this base so far. Your captain is generally known to be somewhat irrational, reckless, if not cocky, and short on common sense. Like the time he refused to show his ID card when requested to do so by the base provost. Colonel Edwin went at the Oak Club. Admiral Tooley was really upset about that one. Then there was the time Manzak stole a government van at the Oak Club when he was drunk and drove at high speed, crashing right through the NSD gates, breaking the barrier and nearly hitting the guards until the van crashed into one of the steel ballards on the pier next to his ship destroying the van. He's quite a character. However, he's still your skipper. And unless he forces the issue by actually charging you with a crime under the UCMJ for destruction of government property, there's not much I can legally do for you men at the moment, since he hasn't legally gone beyond the scope of his position. I recommend that you all go back to your ship and try not to worry about it. He'll settle down because he doesn't have a case against you. But I will also say that if any of you are stupid enough to let your skipper intimidate you into accepting an NJP for the situation, then you deserve what you get for being stupid. Simply refuse NJP and demand that you want a court-martial. He's playing a game with you all. Your skipper knows damn well he'd have to bring any court-martial action ashore here at Nilso, and he isn't going to do that. Now, I know that doesn't sound like what you wanted to hear, but it's the best advice I can give you. If he actually does charge you with a violation for destruction of government property, demand that you be court-martialed. Also, if you have the guts to file a charge against him, an Article 138 complaint of wrongdoing against your superior, then come see me and I'll aid you in the process. 
I'd be more than happy to see it through with you all the way. Are there any other questions, gentlemen? Uh, yes, ma'am, said Quirk. So what good's an Article 138 going to do for us? Well, in reality, probably not a whole lot for you, since an Article 138 is a legal proceeding against your CO, which is investigated via the chain of command by investigators from the Inspector General's office at CTF-73. Possibly some NIS agents, and supposedly non-partial. You file the complaint of wrong, and his superiors must act on it. Ultimately, it goes all the way to SECNA for review and disposition, as the complaint of wrong is investigated. Sadly enough, though, I know of thousands of lawyers who've handled Article 138, and the fact is, we usually don't get much satisfaction even if the CO is breaking the law. The reason is very simple. The system goes out of its way and protects its own, especially of those rank 04 and above, meaning COs. What's good for the goose is never really good for the gander, but it's simply bad publicity. The Navy doesn't like to air its dirty laundry in public. Acting aggressively on an Article 138 against the CO would do just that. Do you fellas honestly think the Navy's going to hang out one of its decorated Vietnam War heroes? A four-striper at the request of a junior officer or enlisted like you guys? Why not? Why not? They asked. Gentlemen, get real. The regulation is on the books to provide the only administrative out for you guys. It makes you believe the system will work for you, when it really doesn't. It's meaningless, so don't be so misguided. You men are truly on your own on the San Clemente, unless the skipper does something so bad and vile as to disgust the conscience of the entire American public, that the Navy Secretary would have no other recourse but to act against him in it. It isn't going to happen. I do hope this answers all of your questions. Master Chief Brown stood up and said, Ma'am, I've heard plenty and appreciate your time. I knew this was a bad idea coming here. Sirs, we got work to do back at the ship. I suggest we get back before we get into deeper trouble with our superiors. If you want, we can discuss this further back there. Yeah, you're right, Master Chief, said Quirk. There's a lot to talk about, and she's given us pretty much the advice we'd expected, so uh, let's go. Goodbye, Commander, and thanks for seeing us. Yeah, thanks, Commander, said Lieutenant Cantley. I hope I don't have to see you fellows again, unless it's socially. But somehow, I think I may see you all again in the future. The men left the base legal with a sick feeling in their stomachs. Upon arrival back at the ship, and while parking the car into the ship's parking space on the pier, the XO was perched atop the starboard bridge wing, watching. He waited until the group disembarked the car and headed up the ship's brow. Richard Askew entered the hatchway and headed to the captain's cabin. He informed the CO that Lieutenants Quirk, Twig, Cantley, and Master Chief Brown had gone to base legal without notifying him. Within several minutes, the XO informed the assistant supo Shapiro that the CO had decided charges would not be initiated against anyone in the supply department for destroying the conveyor. He was told he could inform the men when they returned to the ship of the skipper's sudden change of heart. As usual, Manzac was just playing games. On the quarterdeck, waiting with a smile on his face, was the assistant supo Tony Shapiro. Well, you guys will be pleased to know that the skipper has decided not to prefer charges against you for your destruction of government property. But you've all got him really pissed off now by going to legal. I do hope you're satisfied, gentlemen. That's all the supply department needs right now. More low morale for the troops. Lieutenant Quirk looked Tony square in the eye and said, Piss off, Tony, even if you are the acting department head for supply. Nobody gives a shit what you think. The other officers just marched past Tony to get back to their work. Lieutenant Cantley hadn't quite gotten used to the overall disarray of the ship. Disrespect to shipmates, officers or enlisted alike. Nor the absurd behavior displayed by the CO, XO and others on board. He thought the Navy was supposed to have respect for rank and have some kind of honor among men. It was turning out to be anything but that on the San Clemente. By the time the evening meal rolled around, at 1800 hours, the news of the four going to base legal had circulated throughout the ship. From the galley to the CPO mess to the wardroom, everyone aboard the San Clemente knew the skipper had gone crazy once again, and that three more unfortunate souls were now on his shit list along with the rest of the supply department. Manzac 
was great for holding a grudge against anyone who fought him. Quirk, Twig, and Cantley marched down the passageway, past the supply office, up two flights of ladders, and entered the wardroom. Tired and dragging from their stressful day, they sat at their designated dinner table. Also at their table, Ensign Hershey, Engineering Department Damage Control Assistant, or the DCA, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Bidwell, the weapons officer. Ensign Waters, the dispersing and sales officer, was sitting two tables away with most of the other junior officers. Hey, we heard about the bullshit you guys have been going through today, said Bidwell. In a low voice, so the XO, sitting across the wardroom, wouldn't hear, Ensign Hershey said, well, What the fuck's going on with you guys? Lieutenant Commander Ekub gets shit canned, and now the skipper wants your butts for God knows what? Man, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. Quirk and Cantley leaned forward and both said at the same time, in a very sardonic tone, We, we wish, wish we, we weren't either. either, but we're damn sure not going to let Captain Manzak screw us any more than he's legally allowed. Know what we mean? Yeah, but you guys also have the XO and his Grim Reapers to deal with on this ship of fools, including the new ops officer, deck officer, and the chief engineer. As long as they support the captain, you guys have the uphill battle on your hands, said Bidwell. Yeah, well, maybe so, but I do know my rights under the UCMJ. And although I wish I hadn't come to this ship now, I won't let anyone intimidate me. Yeah, and that goes for me too, said Quirk. Twig remained silent, preferring to sulk in his misery. He felt his life was a mess for reasons beyond his control. He was right. He just found out that the newest love of his life, Bambi, had given him a sexually transmitted disease, even though he thought Bambi was pure. He was totally blind to love, and not the reality of what the girls did to survive in Alangapo. Most were whores at night and working girls during the day to earn a living for their families. Randy didn't want to talk about his problem, but the truth had already been let out of the bag. Dr. Mann told Dave, who in turn told Bob, who told Bidwell, who in turn told everyone else in the wardroom. Few things remained secret aboard ship. Everyone found out that Randy had the clap. The department heads all sat at their dinner table with the XO, as all department heads did staring at their junior officers nearby. Captain Manzak always ate by himself in his at-sea cabin. He wasn't a social creature by any means, except when he's playing cards and drinking alcohol. He didn't like small table talk, and as such he always dined alone. Since Tony Shapiro was now acting head of the supply department, he sat with the other officers friendly to the skipper at the captain's table. Previously, he ate with the lieutenants and other junior officers. Richard Eskew sat next to Tony and the chief engineer opposite them. The officers of the supply department and their table mates just stared at the XO's table. Just look at that dickhead Shapiro over there, said Quirk. What a fucking traitor. He probably assisted in getting Commander Arnett shit canned off the ship knowing his willingness to turn coat on anyone to suit his own benefit. He's probably going to go up after dinner and buttfuck the XO to make him happy. Everyone at the table laughed hysterically at the outrageous comment. It was comic relief like this that kept everyone from going bonkers. At that, Twig popped off. You know, Bob is right. Don't you ever trust that SOB. He always looks out for himself and will fucking stab you in the back the first chance he gets and he doesn't give a crap about any of the enlisted on this ship either. And he wants to make himself look good at the expense of everyone else, including the old supply boss. So just who should I trust on this crazy boat? Asked Bob. Basically your master chief and your wife, Dave and me and nobody else. And what about the ship's chaplain? Can't he be trusted? Asked Bob, wondering about the man of the cloth on board. Oh, not really sure. He stays to himself and doesn't really talk to people much on the ship even though he just lives across the passageway from us. The only time we ever see him is at Sunday service. And most of us are too fucking busy to attend that shit anyway. Such a waste of time. I personally think he acts a little feminine for such a Georgia boy, if you ask me, said Randy. Cantley just looked at Randy with a look of disgust at his comment. Not so much for what he said, but because of his new intolerable situation. He wanted his career in the Navy to be what he dreamt it should be. Devotion to duty, honor, self-reliance, respect for his moral strength, and personal integrity. Bob loved the uniform he wore just like his father. 
Sadly, though, his life was clearly becoming a nightmare much worse than anything his father could have imagined. And worse than any story he'd ever heard about the Navy. He wanted his career to take him to exotic ports, enjoy his time in fellowship, and do something worthwhile that he'd be able to look back on when he retired with pride. He wouldn't. He had met his nemesis, the Spine Ripper. After completing his meal and feeling some indigestion, Bob headed up to officer's country towards his stateroom. Guess I'll see you guys tonight at 8 o'clock reports in Shapiro's stateroom. Yeah, see you later, said Randy. The XO just glared at Bob Cantley as he walked past his table and out of the wardroom door. You know, Bob's a pretty tenacious guy from what I gather, said Dave. Not at all like us. We came from ROTC and you from the academy. Must be because he's OCS and he was a civilian before he joined the Navy. Because he doesn't appear to let all this shit bother him. At least on the outside, said Randy. Lieutenant Junior Grade Bidwell said, You mean he isn't afraid of the Spine Ripper? I'm not sure. Just can't stand the skipper for trying to mess with his head. Sort of like he does with us. Just like I feel at this moment, but I do think it does bother Bob, since he hasn't gotten much sleep since he reported aboard, said Dave. Bidwell replied, Well, I believe this is going to be one interesting cruise, just like the last one, when the old CIC officer, Lieutenant Waddell, got shit-canned. Yeah, I still think what Waddell did when the Spine Ripper first came aboard was great, said Dave. Just think, being out in a utility boat with a walkie-talkie in hand, circling the ship and then thinking no one would hear you. Waddell left the mic handle open, and the skipper and everyone else on the bridge overheard him talking to himself, joking about how we'd like to have the CO take his big ugly gray ship and stick it up the captain's ass. And continued bad-mouthing how stupid the skipper seemed. Imagine that, thinking no one could hear him. But in fact, it blared all over the ship's one MC. Three officers began to laugh hysterically about the past situation. The XO turned his head toward their table as David continued telling the others his stories about the San Clemente. Yeah, and now Lieutenant Commander Ecube gets relieved by the Spine Ripper for not always being exactly on course and making excuses to the skipper about it. <laughs> it's kind of funny, actually. Like the time when the ship set anchor only about 2,000 yards off target from the beach. The XO took over from Jesse, and he couldn't even get us anchored correctly either. But the skipper didn't fire the XO, did he? Nope. He just fired poor old Lieutenant Commander Ecu. The XO thought he'd show everyone on the bridge what a professional ship driver he was. But wound up showing everyone of what a good ship driver he really isn't. <laughs> Again, they all laughed even louder than before. Yeah, both the skew and the CO blamed the incident on Mr. Ecu. <laughs> so funny, though, how those two assholes always want to blame someone else except for the shit that they do. It's like when Hunter told us about Manzac stealing the van, driving drunk, crashing through the gate at the depot, having the Marine guards chase him down the pier, and ramming the government vehicle into a bollard on the pier, and then destroying government property, all while being DUI, said Randy. It's like nothing really ever happens to them. But he always wants to take us to task. Dave continued. And poor old Commander Arnett got shit-canned for simply being a nice guy, and now one of us chops is next on the block for sure. We have nobody to protect us. We're on our own. You think so? Asked Bidwell. Sure do. We'll see. Catch you later, said Bidwell as he got up from the dinner table. Bob said, I gotta go do some work before 8 o'clock reports with Tony. So he headed back to his stateroom to write his first long letter to Shelley since he reported to the ship. It had been well over two weeks since he left her in California, and he felt regret for not writing any sooner. The long trip, the work, and the people he'd encountered had thrown his life into disarray. He knew that he had no excuse for not writing to the person who truly loved him and cared for everything he stood for. He felt despair because he thought his new assignment would be a good for his career, and his life with Shelley. But it wasn't turning out that way. Shelley really loved her job as a PN, and the life they'd built together, and Bob knew it. Somehow, he didn't want to tell her the fairy tale might be ending soon. He had that gut feeling, and it was gnawing at him. He had become like most other married husbands. The relationship they shared wasn't as intense as it once had been in the beginning eight years ago. He wrote love letters and shared his intimate feelings with Shelley, and she did with him. But as the years passed, the need for touching, sharing, and those little things seemed to die off. 
The dread he felt helped him clarify his understanding that the little things which were dying inside were absolutely the most important things in life. He realized as he wrote this letter that he must be more honest with her, and above all, tell her how much she really meant to him. Life was going to be hard enough with a crazy skipper and XO. Writing letters that overflowed with his deepest feelings was Bob's way of maintaining that sanity he had left. So he wrote, My dearest Shelley, the last couple of weeks since I left you in California had been very hard. I know it's been hard on you, too. What I thought was going to be a good two years on a ship has already turned into a nightmare beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Sweetheart, you can't imagine how bad things are here. The CO is nuts. Most of the officers on the ship don't like any of the supply officers, except for the junior line officers. They're okay, but other than that, everybody hates everybody. The first day I reported in Subic Bay, the ops officer, a fellow by the name of Jesse Ecube, was getting kicked off the ship by the skipper. Fired! Can you imagine that? A lieutenant commander getting fired? The captain is a guy named Martin Manzak. He hates all reserve officers, officers married to enlisted personnel, women and blacks. He literally hates all supply officers to the bone. Unless he gets transferred real soon, my goose is cooked. I'm sorry for all the bad news, but if I had any way of knowing how bad things would be here, I would have never have come. I would have instead gone to Italy, where the detailers originally told me is where we could have been sent together. If I could tell you good things, I would. I want you to be happy and not sad, but I feel the worst now. Remember all those letters I sent to the captain and the senior supply officer? Well, they got my letters, but Manzak also stole a letter I sent to the senior supply officer, Commander Arnett, and read it and didn't even bother to give it to him. Seems according to my fellow supply officers that he just didn't want me to find out how bad things really were on board to keep me from coming here. Well, the skipper ordered them not to write to me or even talk to me. The old chop got fired too. The crew and their attitude are so bad, and the admiral at Subic Bay was mad as hell at the captain. This place is not going to be good for my career. I honestly don't know what's going to happen here, but I have bad feelings about what I've gotten myself into by coming to the San Clemente. The other day, a cargo conveyor broke down my first week here due to some unknown reason, and the CO tried to blame it on me and my crew, and to have us court-martialed. I've hardly gotten any sleep since I reported here. My stomach is tied up in knots all the time from worry. I'm depressed, and I don't want to tell you all of this, but I have no one else to turn to except you. I wish I didn't have to tell you this. I wish I had nothing but good things to tell you. I sometimes think I should have gotten out of the Navy two years ago, when I had the chance. You and I could have gone back to my old town and settled down and started that family we talked about. I love you so much, honey, and I wish I could be there with you. But we both know how that goes, don't we? Please be strong, and by the time the San Clemente pulls into port in Aganya, Guam, you'll be standing there on the pier. We'll fall into each other's arms, and then everything will be all right. There's a house waiting for you in the officer's housing section at NAS Aganya. Check with the base housing officer when you arrive there. Also, the furniture's there waiting for you. You'll have to have household goods get it moved in for you. Till then, be strong, safe, and think of me. I really do love you, honey, and I miss you. Let's hope for the best. Your loving husband, Bob. The letter home was put in an envelope, addressed, sealed, and mailed, on his way to 8 o'clock reports at the ship's only mailbox drop, just outside the ship's door. The ship's post office was on the same deck level as his stateroom, and that of Lieutenant Commander Shapiro's. Hours ticked by after nightly reports and evening muster. Within a few short hours, it would be morning again, and more of the same thing. And then sunlight would beam through Bob's porthole of his stateroom. He was one of the few lucky junior officers to have a stateroom with a porthole. In fact, he was the only one, besides the captain and XO because he took over a stateroom that belonged to a lieutenant commander. It was morning, and another day had passed. But the nightmare was just beginning. 
The alarm clock screamed out, beeping at him. Oh, shit, Bob thought to himself. Time to get up and go to the firing squad once again. He caught a quick shower, which consisted of a cold wet down, lathering up, wetting down again, and then rinsing off. Utilizing a total of two full minutes of cold running water. He'd been initiated into the use of cold Navy showers back at OCS and on board the USS Philadelphia. It didn't come as a big shock. He'd wished he had the luxury of being at home, standing in his own hot shower, where he'd used 30 to 40 gallons of hot water and didn't have to worry what anyone would say. Water was a scarcity on board and was to be consumed wisely. At times, the ship's crew would be placed on water rationing for conservation. Ships like the one he was on were old and often had their boilers and condensers break down, so fresh water had to be conserved. When water had to be rationed, nobody was happy. There was nothing worse than a sailor that smelled bad. Bob didn't really care for water conservation, but he always wanted to set an example for the others. He was more upset at having to contend with messy personal relationships of various ship's officers and an erratic skipper. He wasn't a happy camper. Since reporting, he hadn't even had more than a minute to think about his wife since he got the Subic with everything going wrong. Grabbing a bite of toast and a cup of coffee from the wardroom, he headed for the cargo office to meet up with his master chief and to do his daily briefing of the S2 cargo personnel during morning division muster, which included reading the POD, or plan of the day. Muster of the troops was twice daily, once at 0730 in the morning and the other at 17.30, near dusk. The storekeepers of S2 Cargo Division were always more energetic in the morning and later in the evening. They worked harder and longer than any other members of the ship's crew. The rest of the crew usually knocked off with ship's work after 1,800 hours, but not the cargo division. On cargo ships, a full 18 hours a day of committed work was required for all supply personnel. The radiomen worked in shifts, but didn't have to stand long watches. Their work was purely administrative and in air-conditioned spaces. Ops personnel had it easy too, sitting in air-conditioned spaces because of the electronic equipment in the Combat Information Center, or CIC. They drank lots of coffee and didn't do any of the dirty work. The engineering snipes had it harder than anyone else on board, working in temperatures that averaged 120 degrees but they got to stand port and starboard watches. The deck mates, they had really dirty work, but their boss, Lieutenant Jones, took care to see that they got liberty every time the ship pulled into port. Supply was never so lucky, especially on the San Clemente. The bottom line was that nobody cared about them from the skipper on down. It was up to the supply officers to care about their own people. Bob greeted SKCM Brown with a cheery, Good morning, Master Chief. Let's keep the bullshit to a minimum after yesterday's ordeal at the Navy Legal Service Office, okay? Right-o, sir, that works for me. Y'all didn't get a wink of sleep at all last night, did you, Mr. Kennedy? No, Master Chief, uh, I didn't. I tossed and turned all night. Then I took some time to write my wife a letter. You know, that whole thing with legal yesterday got me really worked up inside. Well, sir, let's go form up the troops and get on with today's work schedule. We got a lot of cargo coming on board, and lots to pull for our upcoming unreps. We also need to get rid of our excess stocks before we leave Subic Bay. Just then, Deck Department Officer, Lieutenant Jones, walked by the gathering of S2 Division and gave a glancing sneer at their lieutenant and master chief. Bob returned the sneer with equal gusto and really wanted to flip him the bird, but he didn't. He reserved his anger well, always trying to remain a gentleman. Lieutenant barked the LPO, SK-1 Mendoza. S-2 Division came to attention, and the Master Chief stepped forward to address the men and women at morning muster. Folks, as you all know, we had a bit of trouble yesterday with that pilot conveyor situation. You saw a lot of unsad examples of poor leadership and even conduct unbecoming of certain officers in the deck department. But we'll not let this impact our work for today, now will we? We know we've got pride and a job to do, and we'll get it done despite problems from the higher-ups. The LPO will now read you the POD, after which the division officer will say a few words to you. 
The POD was an abbreviated summary of what was to transpire during the next 24 hours on any particular duty day. It described who was assigned to firefighting teams, who would stand CDO, duty section leader, fire and soundings watch, along with what the meal of the day consisted of, and any other special events to occur during the day on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. After reading the POD, Lt. 